Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Inside the OC. My name is Matt Canizaro, alongside my co-host for this OC podcast dedicated only to the USBC Open Championships, Daniel Ferris. Welcome. Thank you, Matthew. All right. Of course, in this, uh, this crazy times here in 2020, I am in Texas. Daniel is in Kentucky. And we now would like to welcome in our special guest for today's show from Michigan, Andrew Anderson, Team USA member. Andrew, welcome. Hey, thanks. What's up, guys? Appreciate you guys having me. I'm glad to, to get some of your time here. Uh, I know, again, it's a, it's a wild time uh, right now, and, and you do have a little bit of free time. Um, so I, I guess we'll start a off. A little bit's by, an understatement. <laughs> let's <laughs> talk about what's, what's happening in Michigan, what you're up to, uh, what you're doing with this, uh, this brief break from the competition. Yeah, we're on lockdown. We have been for uh, a couple weeks now, and it sounds like we only have a few more days of lockdown until people are going back to work, uh, possibly. Uh, at least the governor hasn't said anything. But uh, honestly, I haven't, uh, haven't been able to do much. I haven't left the house much. But uh, I've got a lot of stuff done on the computer that I want to do. So that's cool. I've been playing some video games. Uh, but I'm ready to get back to normal daily lives, and I really hope um, this craziness can all be over as soon as possible. You know, a lot of people are being affected, and I, I really – Really, just hope that it can get it. Uh, we can get this all cleared up. All right, now you guys were just fresh off the the World Series of Bowling in Las Vegas, um, and you know just part way through really the 2020 season, uh, and now again at home. Um, what are you doing to stay mentally sharp? And, and of course, uh, the Masters was coming up, the Open Championships was coming up as well. Uh, all things that are very important and special to you. We'll talk about that over the next little while. But uh, just talk about how you're staying in the game mentally and, and even possibly physically as well. You know, this feels like um, I'm in high school again. I don't have uh, a car. I can't go anywhere type of thing. And I'm uh, watching a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, I'm watching uh, YouTube videos I'm on. I'm watching YouTube videos uh, my favorite bowlers are on. And uh, I do have a three-ball bowling bag next to my desk here. Uh, just put my hand in a ball and roll it on my bed a few times a day. And there's not much I can do outside of uh, I do have the itch to go practice. Um, it is nice to have that because we we did have a grueling season, and I was I was really looking forward to the Masters, of course, um, one of my favorite events. And um, it, it did suck uh, having to go home early, the Masters being postponed, and now Open Championships being postponed. And just a crazy world we're living in. I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime. And I'm trying more to stay mentally focused on just, like, we're going to get back to our normal daily lives than the bowling aspect right now because I'm going to have the itch to bowl whenever we get to do that again. But uh, I'm hoping it's sooner rather than later because I really do want to actually throw a bowling ball and hit some pins. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, well, today we're going to reminisce a little bit about uh, some of that bowling that you have done. And, uh, and Daniel's been studying. Uh, your USBC Open Championships career a little bit, some numbers. He's our stats and, and analyst guy, uh, so he's going to have some hard-hitting questions about your performance on the tournament lanes, and uh, and then we'll dive into the specifics and, and go down memory lane a little bit with you as well. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, my uh, Open Championships career has been quite a roller coaster of uh, both emotions and scores. So, um, you know, I'm uh, – I'm always looking forward to it, and I, I've gotten the chance to bowl with a lot of really great people over the years already. So, so Matt, I want to ask you, when, when we start talking to Andrew about his OC, do we want to start at the beginning, or do we want to work our way from 2019 back? How do you want to work this? Because both the beginning and the end have two of the biggest, you know, storylines of your OC career. So, Matt, where do you want to start with this? Well, I'd say OC-wise, uh, let's do that. Let's start at the beginning, uh, okay. and then we'll, we'll work our way chronologically and, and bookend it with, uh, a very special moment, and I did get to go back and watch our 2019 video yesterday. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get there, but uh, sometimes I forget, too, uh, that with as much as Andrew has accomplished and uh, as well-spoken as he is, uh, he's just a young guy, uh, so not even a quarter century old at this point, uh, and you just you forget that sometimes, and so going back to 2014, where we're going to start this story, uh, just a youngster hitting the lanes at the O.C., Yep. Yep. I, uh, I was, I was 18 at the time, uh, bowling my first nationals. My brother, uh, talked me into moving up. Uh, I mean, not really his decision. It was my decision to move up early. I decided to, um, become an adult bowler 
uh, much younger than majority of people. And one of the first events I was looking forward to was nationals. And it was really cool that so far of my, I think I'm going on, going on seven years, I've got to bowl with my brother six years of those. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, a that's one of the biggest things for us every year that we look forward to and why open championships is so special to me. And I'm sure you're going to bring up some of those memories, uh, as we go through it. Yeah. The, the, the first one that comes to mind, of course, was 2014. Uh, individually, it was your best year ever, uh, for your all events total, but that wasn't the story that stood out. What stood out from that year was your brother uh, shooting 300 while you all were rocking those awesome jerseys uh, six years ago. Yeah, yeah. So in year one, uh, year one, I was a young kid. I didn't know any better. I was just there bowling. I didn't know, um, you know, I've been told stories about Open Championships and all the history and how cool it is to win an eagle. And uh, some, of my, some of my best friends that I, I – Pretty much all my best friends now have an eagle, it feels like, um, in one way, shape, or form. And uh, when I was going to Open Championships the first year, I was asked, well, I really didn't know any better. It was in um, it was in Reno, I believe, at the National Bowling Stadium. And uh, I got to bowl at the National Bowling Stadium for the first time in my life with my brother. And honestly, nerves didn't really hit me the first year because, again, I didn't know any better. I didn't know how big of an event it was. I was just showing up, and my brother was like, hey, man, you're going to crush it. I'm like, all right, let's go do it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it was my best year. And I was like, man, open championships is a cakewalk. What are you guys talking about? Wow. <laughs> and and I, learned, I learned real quick that it's not a cakewalk after that. But, uh, you know, it was really a, it was a special event because I was bowling really good. Uh, we made a team run in my very first events ever wearing Power Ranger jerseys. That was my idea. And uh, the team was like, Power Rangers? I'm like, let's just do it. Let's do it. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to bring the heat. And, uh, you know, after team event, my brother actually had a rough team event. And I, I think my brother at the time still, uh, he wasn't known as Andrew's brother just yet. I was, I was making a name for myself. Uh, I, he'll, he'll watch this. I'm going to love it. Uh, there's a bunch of memes going out right now in our free time about my, my brothers. Um, but, uh, you know, he had a rough, he had a rough start to team event, I should say. And, uh, you know, he, he was more excited to be there than I was. Cause that was our first time bowling together. Honestly, uh, we bowled adult juniors maybe twice as I was a kid, but the, the timing never worked out and our ages never worked out. When he moved up, he first started bowling a lot of stuff. And then by the time we should have bowled in some adult juniors, um, I was ready to move up. So we never got that chance. And that was our first opportunity to bowl together. And although we were on different teams that year, uh, we did get, we were looking forward to doubles and singles. And when he shot 300 uh, in team event, you know, obviously that was a super special moment. I didn't know how big of a moment it was until maybe after the fact, but uh it was a really big moment for him and us, and uh, being able to share that with him was really special. Well, ironically, as we were talking this morning, uh, you mentioned you know he's now known as sometimes as Andrew's brother. Uh, I didn't even remember that you were there that year, to be honest. I just remember that was the year of Matthew Anderson and uh, you know the jerseys and and the whole deal. And um, so it turns out you were you were quietly doing your thing as well, having your best year, which is uh, which is which is kind of funny considering. Uh, how much time we've now spent together in the, the six years since. But, uh, um, you know, at that time, I think uh, you were Matthew Anderson's brother. And the next year, was. Uh, he uh, he got announced for the first time in the squad room, something that's very special to our Open Championships titleist and, and honor score shooters. Um, and I think that's the moment when it becomes real and maybe when everybody else gets a little bit jealous too. But uh, can you talk about the, the years that followed and, and, and being in there knowing that you now have – uh, a minor understanding of the event and the prestige and the challenge and of course uh, you know what it means to to be announced in that squadron yeah um like i said we did make a run uh that first year and i have bowled on many different teams now it feels like i think four or five different teams and um you know the first couple of years were probably the most special because of uh, multiple reasons one uh it was my first year i didn't really it was my best year. I bowled with uh, some really close friends. We we made a run the first year, and then uh, year two we actually hit a very uh, rough patch. You know, we we got beat up. We did not bowl very well. Uh, we didn't see the lanes well. But the highlight of the week was sitting in the the squad room, and we're like we're like 20 minutes out, 
and my brother's like kind of like ants like i know when my brother's antsy and he's nervous i'm like man we're gonna bo- we're gonna bowl fine he's like no oh, no dude that's not what i'm worried about i gotta stand up I'm like what are you talking about he goes they're gonna announce my name as a uh, I forget what it was, what he called it. He called it uh, like a superstar. He's like, they're going to call me out as like a superstar here or something. I'm like, hey, man, that's awesome. Like, he's like, dude, I'm nervous. I'm like, ah, oh, you're going to be fine. <laughs> and then so apparently most years they do it by alphabetical order. Well, we we're on the last, we were on one of the last pairs that year. So they're going through all the names and they have, we have like eight or nine other people in there that have either bowled for 20 years or have a 300, have an eagle. And so they're at like, number eight and my brother's like they forgot about me i'm like nah dude i don't think so and then legitimately they actually didn't call his name out and so we're sitting there and they're like all right guys stand up get ready to go and so now my brother's like i guess they forgot i shot 300 so our, our one of our teammates went up there and let him know so now it's even more awkward so they had everybody sit back down and they're like hey we forgot somebody and then they had Matt stand up, and now we talk about how nerve-wracking it is because everybody was looking at him like, hey, we want to go bowl. And, uh, yeah, so that year, year number two was almost as uh, as cool as year number one, even though we bowled much worse, uh, just because I got to see how much that moment meant to my brother. And, um, you know, not, then that set, that set new goals for me. I wanted, I wanted that. I wanted to know what that was like. And, obviously, years later, we can talk about it later. But. Um, it was a, it was a moment that I won't forget. That's for sure. Okay. Yeah, you well, talked about forward. after, oh, I was going to say you, you mentioned, I wanted, I feel like almost you should be apologized to because you talked about how after your first year at the OC was in Reno in 14, you shot 2037 and you thought, man, this is a piece of cake. And then the very following year is what most people would say is, has been one of the hardest years since was El Paso. That was kind of mean to give you the stadium, to give you oh, 2000 yeah. and then send you off to El Paso to just a, yeah. a, a bloodbath of a of an event <laughs> yeah yeah uh, i'm pretty sure my second year was my worst year i i think it, it was yeah yeah we don't even have to talk about those scores if you don't if you don't mind but uh no it was not a great year i'll leave I, it out of the conversation yeah 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 no year number two was not uh great it brought down my open championships average in a hurry um but yeah, I um, I knew they were hard the second year. We didn't know how hard they were until we got there. And uh, when you don't break the lanes down correctly, when they are that brutal, things are not going to go well. And unfortunately, you know what's what's cool about Open Championships is like I bowled collegiately, and I know what the team atmosphere is like. And um, this event is so big to so many people, and it it really does like change your outlook on team events of how you you prepare for them uh how much you're working for them beforehand and we bowled so well year one i think that we got carried away and we just thought we were going to be able to walk in and give it another run and we didn't uh, practice together as a team nearly as much the second year uh we didn't plan as much like bowling ball wise second year and i think that i think that that opened my eyes to like if you really want to win an eagle you have to be prepared and you have to be a, a cohesive unit and you have to, and uh, after year two, I, I did end up, um, my brother and I, and actually the whole team, we kind of dispersed uh, elsewhere. And uh, that led me into um, bowling with Team Turbo, I believe in 2000, I think I had one more year maybe. Who did I bowl with in 2016? You, Daniel, I'm gonna need you too, man. I, I think I'm looking you have, at uh, your Skippers yeah, you 2.0 was 2016. What was the team name? Skippers 2.0. Skippers 2.0. That was with, um, okay, that was with the Virginia guys. That was in, um, was that National Bowling Stadium again? Yes. Yeah, 16 was Reno. Yeah, so (laughs) I do have a lot of memories at Open Championships because in 2016, actually, uh, three months prior to Open Championships, I was on Junior Team USA I was uh, 20, and I had a chance of traveling. Um, it was a huge summer coming up because uh, Junior Team USA was traveling to Worlds that year. I had a chance, and I fell asleep on an airplane for my 21st birthday on May 10th, and I, I woke up on the plane, and I couldn't move my right arm. And uh, we bowled Open Championships uh, middle of July, I believe. And I went to the doctors and, you know, I'm freaking out, thinking I need surgery, something's wrong. 
and I did have a pretty big major nerve problem uh, in my right arm. Uh, I actually fell asleep on it to a point where I put my nerve to sleep. So I couldn't move my right hand. And I go to the doctor and I'm like, hey man, um, when do you think I can bowl again? And he's like, you know, he gives you, of course, the worst news. He's like, there's a chance you're not bowling for years. And I'm like, years, I got a bowl. I got, got uh, Junior Team USA camp in uh, two weeks. He's like, <laughs> he's like, two weeks, no way. And, you know, so long story short, we don't get to bowl, but uh, that Open Championships was the first time I had thrown a ball competitively after that um, that accident or whatever you want to call it, that freak of an accident. And uh, I bowled with a wrist brace on the one and only time I've ever bowled with a wrist brace on in my life. I I don't know if there's any videos out there, but uh, imagine, like, I, I feel like I have a lot of wrist movement in my swing. <laughs> and mm-hmm. to bowl with the Robbie's revs on my hand was the weirdest thing ever. But I will say, for all, uh, I did beat my year prior by a lot of pins with a wrist brace on. You did? And um, I felt like Norm Duke. I stood, I, I stood on 20 and I looked at 10 <laughs> for nine games. <laughs> For nine games straight, uh, because I couldn't hook the ball. I just had, I had nothing. I had no wrist strength. Uh, I was lucky enough that the doctor even said I could bowl. I was bowling with like a, I think I bowled with a 14 pound balls instead of 15. And I, it was very close to me bowling with 12 at Nationals. I was going to take a two ball bag with like a 12 pound, like whatever ball was out at the time. Um, but yeah, so every year there's something new, you know, like it, every year at Open Championships, it's a funny new story and it's hilarious. Well, now you've mentioned uh, some some teammates and uh, that you have switched teams a few times over the years and had the chance to bowl with some young superstars early on. Uh, but then later, and we're transitioning now, we're past 2016 uh, and getting into when you really started to shine on the championship lanes. But uh, you, you found your way into bowling with, uh, some of the SMB Pro Shop guys, Kurt Pilon, uh, to name a few, but uh, those guys have a, a legacy of more than two decades at the Open Championships, going back to the Dan Ottman days in the late 1990s. Uh, and some variations of that team have continued to find their way toward the top of the leaderboard each year, find a success uh, along the way. Uh, it's recently a 2012 a, a Team All Events title uh, with uh, Bill Orlikowski and those guys. Um, and then uh, again, uh, Kurt Pilon and, and the latest variation of a part of that group uh, in 2018, uh, a very memorable venue and year for you. Uh, and we'll, we'll go to, we'll talk about that um, in kind of a, a breakout for you. Uh, maybe not necessarily at the OC in, in March, uh, but that gave you an opportunity to see the venue in Syracuse, the on-center convention center, uh, get a feel for the lanes, the approaches, and to see some guys have some phenomenal success. Um, and no doubt, again, as you mentioned, you were pushed by your brother shooting 300 and, and the, the near misses that you had early on there. Um, I imagine that 2018 was a whole lot of fun to be a part of, even if it was the other team that ended up finding the uh, the Eagles that year. Yeah, so 2018, I mean, we can talk about 2018 for a lot of, a lot of time because it is obviously the highlight. Uh, most of my highlights already in my career were made in 2018. But honestly, I would say arguably – um, one of my biggest years at Open Championships is probably 2017 when I bowled my one and only year with the Turbo teams. Uh, Turbo, I I, um, I couldn't make it work where I went with Kip Roberts and uh, that team again, uh, timing-wise. And um, Turbo offered me a spot with their team. But the problem was is I was getting my PBA card. So I couldn't bowl with the team uh, that Turbo put together that they wanted to, but what was cool about it is they gave, Turbo gave me the option to kind of handpick the guys I want to bowl with and put a team together myself. So my team consisted of um, Frank Sodgrass, which is actually one of my roommates I live with, um, Eric Tully, uh, James Koss, and Corey Hines. And not all names you'll know, but to us in Michigan, those are all names that have uh, stood out for, for, years now and especially the younger guys Eric Tully was kind of the uh the older statesman of the group but uh we made my best run at a team uh team title that year and we actually came it came down to the 10th frame of uh, James Cost and I both strike out we would have taken the lead by two and uh unfortunately we ended up missing by uh, nine pins I think uh something like that we finished second or tied for second 
So uh, 2017, I, I just don't want to oversight that because I think that's arguably my best year because I went from being, um, that was a transition year for me because I went from bowling on teams where I was maybe an odd man out per se. I was invited late. Uh, these teams have been put together. I was the add-on where that was the first year that I put together the team I kind of wanted to bowl with. And we, we made a very good run. And unfortunately, due to the due to rules, um, we couldn't keep the same team together. Well, but let's, let's talk about that day one more time real quick before we move on to 2018. Uh, because you're right. And, and as much as I forgot about that day, uh, that was pretty memorable for us as well. Um, you guys bowled in the afternoon, the early team squad yeah. that day. And, uh, and obviously made a, a ton of noise um, as far as making a run at the top spot. And that's my job is to be there. And, uh, and be ready when that does happen. Um, and after shooting 12-27 that... in game two, yep. you, uh, you know, we were there. We were ready. Facebook Live doing, doing what we do. What we now know Ferris knows for sure. Uh, it's just procedure. Uh, so at that point, I had uh, kind of after game one, didn't see a whole lot happening. Uh, you guys shot 966. Uh, so I was like, <laughs> it's, it's probably okay to, to go and sneak out of here for a minute. Uh, left things in, in the capable hands of the, the rest of the staff, and I went to grab some dinner and uh, and a haircut, actually. And uh, I was in the haircut chair, and I got the message that you guys had shot over 1,200 game two, and things were possible. Things were happening. I know Adam Barta, I'm sure, was uh, was was nervous if they had already bowled out of the <laughs> time frame there. But um, so I get out of the haircut chair real quick and um, get back to the venue and hair everywhere, get the step ladder out. You guys were right in front of the center desk there. Uh, so Facebook Live, and then as you mentioned, the 10th frame came up a little bit short and ended up third uh, for the year, uh, and then packed it all up, went home that night, was getting ready to sit down and relax, took the tie off. Five minutes later, a uh, team from Ohio, I believe it was, is uh, Shop Makers Pro Shop. So listed as Michigan. Yep. Uh, but some Toledo, yeah. Yep, some Ohio guys in there. Uh, they're doing the same thing, making a run. So put the tie back on, go back to the venue, get the get the stuff out, the camera out, Facebook Live. Uh, there's no way these guys aren't taking the lead. This is it. It's yeah, happening. they had a huge start. Yeah, they had a huge start. Yeah, and uh, and then it comes down to the to the end of game number three again, and uh, and they didn't manage to get a thousand that game, uh, and then ended up tying they tied you guys. Us, right? Yeah, they, they tied, tied us. You on the same day, back to back team events. Uh, yeah. I don't know. The heart rate was going pretty much that uh, that entire day, and uh, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. That's what the OC really is all about. Uh, yeah. And then now we can transition into a different kind of excitement in 2018 in Syracuse. Yeah, and Syracuse has a very special place in my heart. Obviously, normally behind me, uh, you would see my check from the Masters on my wall. I actually took it down recently, uh, changed my room up, and. Uh, doing some different things, but uh, Syracuse and the On Center will uh, always have a special place in my heart now um, for multiple reasons, but like you said, uh, in uh, the Masters was, uh, what month? Um, in May that year? It was, uh, uh, it was the end of March, early April. Um, end of March, early April, yeah. So, you guys, it was, it was a unique year because we started the Open Championships and we ran for about a week, uh, and then we took a break to invite the Masters in to the On Center. Uh, so competition at the OC completely stopped for the Masters to take place. But you guys were among the few teams that yep. got the chance to bowl before the Masters came through. Yeah, and uh, I was I was wholeheartedly, uh, like a month before we bowled, a month and a half, uh, trying to make it work where I bowled with the Turbo Squad again. Uh, obviously, I, I was really looking forward to that again and making run and that we just could not fit the teams together where we only had uh, either one PBA bowler or one Team USA member. Or we, we just couldn't make it work where, because we had like 20 people and of those 20, we had six, we had two titleists, we had multiple Team USA members. Long story short, I told them that I was actually going to take the year off. So I was planning on not bowling open championships at all that year. And I went back to work and at the time I was working with Kurt Pilon at uh, Bowling IQ and uh, you guys definitely know this, especially you, Matt. Uh, Kurt Pilon and I have a very fun uh, friendship. You know, we just do. And uh, we, uh, I, I owe a lot of my success to him. He's taught me a lot. Uh, but that year, he was like, hey, man, um, we can put it together where you're, you're on the companion team. I was like, uh, the rule is my brother comes too. He's like, I oh, will make it work. I'm like, all right, sweet. So 
we're uh, literally like I have to book a flight. I bowl in like three weeks at this point type of thing. I don't bowl with the guys. I know uh, that when it comes to Open Championships, uh, nobody, nobody wants to win more than Kurt, in my opinion. I mean, I want to win. Believe me, I'm a competitor. But when it comes to preparing for an event, I didn't know that it meant, uh, like, I mean, he was practicing more for that event than he was practicing for uh, the U.S. Open. I mean, I was like, man, it's it's nine games, Kurt. Like, you don't got to bowl 24 the day before. And he's like, no, nah, man, it's a, it's a nine-game sprint. You got to throw every single one good. I'm like, all right. I mean, I respect that. So um, you know how uh, basketball teams, like, go through these different, like, squads, right? Like, the process in Philly. And, uh, like, that's the first thing that comes to mind. That's what our group felt like. It was like the – it was like the – going to work Pistons in 2004 and 2005. I'm a huge Pistons fan, so you guys know. <laughs> and that and that's what that year felt like because going up to it, uh, me and Kurt were working on a lot of things, uh, like both physically and all that. But uh, prior to going to Open Championships, I had made the Tournament Champions show. And right after the Tournament Champions show, I didn't bowl the next couple of events because they're either invite only or whatever it was. So I actually had a month off before I bowled both Open Championships and the Masters. And in that break, uh, I was working a lot of things. And, you know, Kurt, Kurt told me this, and I'll never forget it. He goes, uh, you, can't, you can't strike if you're running, you're running out the shot. Bef- I think it's uh, – I don't know how he worded it. He worded it way better than it is in my head. But long story short, he said, you can't strike if you don't um, – if you run out the shot before it's off your hand. Because I had this weird thing where, like, when I needed a shot or I really wanted to throw it good – I would throw it and then I would walk it out before it's even like halfway down the lane. So he called it, uh, you're going to work, Andrew. You got to go to work. So you got to go to work every shot. So for like a month straight, all he told me is like, go to work. And what he meant by that was you got to post every shot. Every shot means something. And uh, I didn't take it as seriously at the time until we got to nationals. And I was arguably bowling the best I've ever bowled in my life. And uh, we bowled team events and I shoot like... I, I, I bowled I bowled fine. Uh, our team didn't make much noise in comparison to what I was watching out of the other squad. But uh, it was really amazing to see that side of not only Kurt, but Bill Olikowski, uh Ryan Mao. Uh, they had Marcus McLean, which is, uh, in my opinion, one of the best young bowlers in the world that really nobody knows about yet, even after winning an Eagle. And then Andrew Burke, who uh, we also – worked with and to Andrew, uh, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't bowl a whole lot of events at home, uh, but he bowls open championships and he practices with Kurt every day prior. And uh, as this was all unfolding and the magic was happening and Kurt was doing Kurt things (laughs) is what I call it. Uh, Kurt, Kurt was making ball reaction out of nothing. The lanes were not as easy as Kurt made them look. I promise you that. Um, I was bowling really good and I thought they were pretty, pretty difficult and that's how that's just a testament to how good Kurt bowled uh and it was a team effort 100 percent but Kurt really led the way in not only showing his squad how much it meant to him but showing us all that uh even while you're having a good time um you can still make noise and uh compete at a very high level and uh without watching Kurt that day on those lanes even though I bowled I watch more than I bowled that day. It feels like when I look back on it, I don't remember. I always look back on events and I remember my own scores. I remember my own blocks, what bowling balls I threw. Uh, but all I remember about that day is watching Kurt bowl at such a high level that I had never seen in person before. And uh, it really inspired me to say, hey, man, like, uh, if he can do this, I can do this. Uh, you got to have a work ethic. You got to put the time in. And you have to make every shot mean something. And then, uh, obviously, I had um, a lot of motivation for many different reasons uh, to bowl well at the Masters. But um, without the Open Championships being in Syracuse and me being comfortable in the on center, um, ironically enough, uh, my first game, my first match of match play was on the pair that uh, we bowled our team event on. And Matt... You know the reason why I know that. Uh, but uh, it was a really weird occurrence because when I made the cut of the Masters, I was, I mean, I was just 
as Kurt would say, I was going to work and uh, it didn't hit me until like midway through game one of that match where, when, when uh, I got a text from one of the people we bowled with and he was like, Hey God, like it's meant to be, you're, you're right on the same pair again. And I'm like, you know, this is really cool. And then it, it clicked right there in my head. Uh, just the memories of open championships just a few weeks prior uh, and watching Kurt do what he did and the team and Bill Olikowski and Ryan Mao and all those guys stepping up to the plate in big moment. I mean, shot after shot, they just did not miss as a team. And uh, that's what's so cool about open championships. It doesn't take one guy uh, as good as Kurt uh, bold. It took all five of them uh, really throwing a lot of good shots towards the end of that event to take home the title or we didn't know at the time but well let's let's rewind a little bit to uh, to that night of the team event uh i i don't know where i was but uh aaron smith was was there had a, having a great time and we had some some new staff members on site as well and uh for christine um the first interview that she gets to do is uh is kurt pilon and, and you guys and you're right you guys have a lot of fun out there um thank you for not scaring her off at that moment um, but uh, when I was in the next day for your doubles and singles, and uh, and and the strikes continued. Of course, uh, those guys went on to win the team event. Uh, Hundred days later, and uh, and Kurt picked up the all events title. Uh, but uh, he struck all throughout the day, and uh, that was probably one of the most fun photo shoots I think uh, I've ever had after a, after somebody taking the lead. And uh, Christine <laughs> was there again, and she came back to work that day, which was. Uh, I was very grateful for that as well, but uh, that certainly set the tone for the event and the camaraderie and the chemistry and, and kind of what that means. And, you know, no matter what was happening, you guys were there to support each other and, and communicate and, and it paid off. And that is what the Open Championships is all about. And, uh, and then you're right as well, coming back for the Masters and, um, you know, that one loose floor tile to, uh, to set the tone and remember, you know, where you were, what happened in that venue. Uh, and to, to calm you down, to, to make the run that you did. At that point, um, you know, you're still searching for that, that first PBA title. Um, you're coming off the TOC show, uh, and then the momentum, it just started for you. Uh, and then there you are, the number one seed for the TV show. And just talk about walking through that venue at that point as each match progressed and you got closer to the show and, and things were unfolding for you. Yeah, so one one funny story before we get into the Masters thing is after we got home from Nationals, I only had maybe like a week, week and a half in between. Like I flew home and I'm flying right back out type of thing or driving. No, I drove. I flew there the first time and I'm driving back to Syracuse uh, like a week later for Masters. But in that week, um, me, me and Kurt would talk and there was still some teams bowling Nationals before we went out. And... Kerr would always be like, yeah, there's, I mean, it would be cool to win an Eagle. Like, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to look at it every day type of thing. I'm like, all right, dude. Yeah, sure. Like you won't, no problem. <laughs> so we go to work like a day later and I walk in and him and Andrew are looking at scores the next day because a team shot like a thousand ten game one. I'm like, you guys have got to be joking me, right? We've been home, we've been home a day. Like you guys are safe. Like that was a score. You guys, you guys aren't being beat. And they're like, well, they got 1,010, and, like, four guys have a double game, too. I'm like, they got a double? That's great. I mean, sweet. Uh, the power of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So um, two days later, like, I, I don't go to work for a day. I come back in, and Andrew's up there. He's like, dude, you got to check this out. These guys might catch us. And so these guys these guys have, like, 960 game one, and then, like, 1,060, and then they all start with a double. And I'm like, so they need uh, 1,300? Like, you think they're going to get it? <laughs> And he's like, there's a chance. I'm like, listen, man, you got to, I don't know what you got to do, but go take a walk or something. You're going to be fine. <laughs> so I already knew what we were in for, for those next couple months, because I, I really thought they put up a score that wasn't being beat. So I knew the score watching was going to be intense and fun, but I didn't know it was going to get to the level that it did. But it was, uh, that was really cool to be a part of as well as not only watching them bowl there, but watching the reaction time after time, waiting to see if they were actually going to uh, win the coveted Eagle that they, that they so rightfully deserved. Uh, well, but yeah. And, and oh, about Kurt too. Um, you know, you're right. He, he's a, again, he's a fun guy. He's a funny guy. Uh, he played that off pretty well uh, because uh, he yeah. left and he's like, ah, you know, it's no problem. You know, he already had the one Eagle from, from 97. 
um, and and the things that happened to him in his life with the heart surgery and just uh, the great storylines along the way. Um, but I didn't hear from him the entire Open Championships, which, you know, some champions I'll hear from, you're right. Anytime somebody throws a double or, or shoots a thousand, you know, it's a Facebook Live. Come on, doing the flip charts. And we'll talk to Adam right. Barter especially uh, about that and what that weight is like with the live scoring and the technology and the social media. Uh, but Kurt played it cool. And even on the last day of the event, you know, when the, they sometimes get a little bit antsy and they're checking in, when's the last squad, who's bowling on this squad, uh, nothing. And uh, finally, I couldn't get a hold of him all day to tell him, hey, bro, you just won two Eagles. Uh, he's like, oh, you know, I was taking a nap. I was cleaning the garage. Like, no, it wasn't. The last day of the event. But uh, I, maybe I remember really the last. Like I remember the last day of the event very well. And I promise you, Kurt was not taking a nap. And he was not cleaning his garage. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, it's it was really cool to see that side of uh, the Open Championships as well because my couple of events I, I had nothing to wait for anymore. So once my event was over, I was looking forward to next year, and it would it would be cool to see who won. But there was no reason for me to watch scores every day. But uh, I I watch scores every day with the guys, <laughs> so I, I kind of felt what they were feeling, and I think that's why it meant even more to me. It's because I went through those feelings with them, and I really wanted it for them. Uh, you know, but uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, last week we had Matt McNeil on, and we talked with Matt about the aha moment where you, it kind of hits you how big this tournament is if you don't know going into it. And you said, you know, the first time you bowled it, you were 18. You didn't know. And the first time I bowled it, I wasn't quite aware of how big it was. You've talked about all these memorable moments, your brother shooting 300, uh, your all's run at team event in 2017, watching Kurt and those guys in 2018. What was your aha moment when you realized, oh, man, this event is – it's not just nationals. This is a, you know, watching Kurt prepare for 2018. You said it was like a side of him you hadn't seen before on the lanes in his preparation. What was your aha moment for this event? I have multiple, I think. I don't think one stands out in particular. I think that there's multiple moments. Um, I think my first year was a huge moment. I think that after I got done and the guys are like coming up to me like, man, you bowled incredible. And to me, it was just another day of bowling at the time. You know, obviously, I'm not trying to downgrade it all. But at the time, that's what I was thinking. I was like, man, I'm just blowing another event. This is awesome. I mean, at the time, I had no expectations of myself, really. I was just out there bowling. I was a kid having fun. Uh, I was I was just happy that somebody wanted me to bowl with them. And then mm -hmm. uh, I put up 2037. They're like, dude, you bowled incredible. Oh, my God. I'm like, guys, what do you mean? I averaged like, I averaged like 220 or something like that. Like, at the time, that's what I'm saying. And they're like. 220 at the national at open championships. That's incredible. I'm like, all right. I mean, that was, that was the first introduction to it. And then once I started learning the history of it, my ha ha mo or aha moment was actually the next year when I, when I got my head beat in, I was like, I can't let this happen again. Like I can't, like I bowled so bad, not only physically, but mentally. I was like, this thing hit me right in the face. Mm -hmm. I, I had no clue what I was expecting. Um, I really was just like, my expectations were almost too high for year two because of year one. And uh, I didn't give it, I did not give the tournament the credit it deserves um, and the work ethic that it needs if you want to be successful at it. So I would say multiple moments, but uh, you know, uh, 2018 was obviously not, uh, I don't know what kind of moment I want to call it, but it was kind of my way of getting back um, all those like, Watching them win or watching them put the lead uh, was my moment of saying, I want to do that. Like, I want to feel that feeling. Um, I had never really I, – I've won bigger events. I've won some bigger an amateur events. The uh, Bud Light Challenge in 2014 uh, was my highlight of my life uh, when it comes to winning events up until that. And obviously, Junior Team USA was huge to me, a huge part of my life. And um, – but – that moment in 2018, uh, watching them walk off, uh, us celebrating, um, I wanted to, I wanted to feel that feeling. I mean, that was that was the gist of it. I mean, everybody has their own uh, um, opinions of why I was so motivated that year, and I still am motivated. I haven't lost in that motivation, um, but obviously that year was really special to me, and I I made a lot of a lot of noise and a lot of different events, but. Um, Nationals that year was a huge stepping stone for me uh, after making the TOC show to, not, to now say I made it there, but now I want to feel what it's like to get over that hump. 
and uh, mm -hmm. watching some of my best friends get over that hump in front of my eyes really inspired me to say, Andrew, like, you can do it too. Um, you know, you have to have the work ethic and you have to, you have to put the time in and uh, it'll all come together when it's time. And just a few short weeks later, I'm in this magical run of becoming the top seed for the USBC Masters. And, you know, I, I owe a lot of that credit to not only uh, Open Championships, but to Pilon and that group bowling I bowled with. Well, now that, that moment, that Masters title, um, you know, starting with the Open Championships and it just snowballed from there. It was, uh, it was a, an incredible year for you, a career year to this point. Um, but that first title, holding that trophy, Describe that moment, locking that up and just being able to, to show it off and, and do that victory lap. Yeah, like I didn't know if I was supposed to cry, if I was supposed to scream, if I was supposed to – I didn't know what I was feeling. Uh, I went numb. Like um, I, I remember holding – I remember not knowing when I was supposed to pick up the trophy if I won. Like I was going – like all these things going through my head um, in that single moment when I found out that I won. And I, I was like, uh, you know, I congratulated Alex on a, a second consecutive great year. Uh, I mean, he bowled incredible year after year. And uh, when, I, when I actually won, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. Like, I was like, okay, so who, whose hand do I shake? Where do I go? I'm looking around. I'm looking for somebody to point me in the right direction. And uh, I hug Rob Gottschall, and uh, he, he tells me to go get your title. And, you know, holding up that trophy – uh, that I actually have sitting in front of me on my uh, on my stand here. Um, it was it, it was a culmination of so many feelings coming together in one event, and uh, you know, I I owed it to so many people because uh, I I would not have been there. I I um, I got a lot of opportunity when I was younger because of other people, and that moment right there uh, said it was all worth it. And that's the way I'm going to describe it for the rest of my life is all the work that you put into something, people say some dreams are far-fetched, and I just don't believe it anymore. All right, now, first title, first major, and it's still early in the year. It's only April at that point, uh, and you weren't done yet. You had uh, a few more things up your sleeve, and, and we ended the year pretty well also. But uh, just talk about the following months and, and, and proving, again, that, that it wasn't a fluke. It wasn't a one-time deal. And, uh, you know, you're able to continue that momentum through 2018. Yeah, so the Masters uh, obviously gave me a lot of confidence. Um, when you win one, uh, you feel like you can win them all. And that's just the mindset I had. I went into every single event having the mindset that I was there to win and that I wanted to be the best. And I still want to be the best. Uh, and after the Masters, it's hard not to have the feeling of – uh, you know, you have complete control. Like I bowled the Masters, and I was, I was throwing the ball so many different ways, and I I could win. I I could win so many different ways. It felt like, and um, just a short month or month and a half later, we didn't have many events. It was just we had TOC uh, and Indy, month off Masters, month off, and then some summer events. Well, in Jonesboro, Arkansas, I actually started the events after two games. I was in like fourth to last place. Um, and that was a game changing moment for me right there is because I had all this confidence and then I start this event with like a 160, 170 and the lanes were very hard, very, very hard where like a 205 average was incredible at the time, uh, which you don't see very much on the PBA tour. But, uh, um, that, that day, uh, stands out to me a lot because I dug really deep just to make the cut. I was like the last person in the cut. Uh, and then the next, the next day is a round robin, or not round robin, a cashier's round type of thing. I bowled six more games or whatever the allotment was, and then I was like first or second into match play. So now there's 16 of us in match play, uh, top four step ladder, and I went from 15th or sixth. I, I believe I was 15th, or I was in by five pins at the cut, whatever it was. I was either 15th or 16th. Um, and next thing you know, I'm the top seed once again. I make a run in match play, and, you know, I shoot 220 after 220, and uh, I go all the way up to the top seed, and I have to bowl Tom Doherty for the title. And that title match, I, I promise you, was way easier on my uh, mental psyche than the Masters one. Uh, one, 
we weren't in this big stadium of a venue for my first title. It was so cool <laughs> to win in this big stadium. And then uh, the second one felt, uh, uh, the second one made me feel more like I belong than the first one. The first one, the Masters, um, you know, look at the draw at times. I didn't really have many matches at the Masters where I really dominated my opponents. I just kept winning matches, like by 10 pins here, 20 pins there. I mean, every match felt close. Where Arkansas, I didn't want that. I wanted to win the title. I just wanted to set in stone that I was here to stay and uh, nobody was going to take that away from me. And I bowled arguably, in my opinion, the best game of my career in that title match. Uh, I started, while the lanes are incredibly hard, I started with the front eight or front seven before shooting 260. And 260 on that was 330 pins anywhere else it felt like. So mm -hmm. um, that, that uh, tournament was huge for me. And uh, I think that a lot of the rest of the year is a blur uh, for many reasons, but um, I bowled really, really good at a lot of events and I've had a lot of top 10 finishes. I just never really got over the hump again, uh, but I've made multiple step ladders after. Um, but the highlight of that year in between Arkansas and ending the year was uh, obviously Hong Kong with uh, Matt and, um, you know, we can talk about that, but uh, really the for the PBA Tour year and um, my year as a professional bowler, uh, it could not have gone any better outside of winning more events, but uh, I was just so happy and I still am so happy that I, uh, I felt like I proved not only, I, I just proved myself wrong. You know, for a lot of, everybody has their own inner demons. I was always worried if I could ever get over the hump and to get over the hump twice in a matter of months against the best bowlers in the world, you can't you can't draw up a better story. So in 2018, you picked up the the Chris Schenkel PBA Player of the Year award, and I guess this is where what Matt talked about early on. Some of the hard hitting questions come in. Certainly, if you, if you don't when you win a Player of the Year award at any level, if you don't follow it up with the same award the next year, that next year can be described as disappointing because you you play the year the year before. But 2019 was was a little more disappointing than that uh, for you. Just strictly looking at the numbers. So what happened between 18 and 19? And, and what was the drop-off last calendar year? Yeah, I mean, um, mentally, uh, it is hard to follow that up. And I will go, like, I respect Jason Bamani to a whole nother level uh, because of how hard it is to be him. I mean, it really is. To have the expectations that he has on his shoulders, so many people watching him. I was, when I won, when I won in 2018, I, I still feel like, uh, I, I look back at it and I tell myself that I was still a kid. Um, I did not know what it was like to be in the spotlight. I did not know what it was like to be mature enough to handle those expectations. Um, however, in, in Hong Kong, unfortunately, uh, I did injure my finger way worse than I thought I did. Uh, I tore my extender, extensor tendon in my middle finger. I probably should not have finished the events. At the time, I didn't know that. You know, I bowled the, bowled the rest of the events and I gave it my all. And I still bowled fine. We won, uh, we won some medals. You know, we lost to we lost to Italy in the team title match, and um, you know that was that was the memory in my head going into 2019 is we lost the team title, and I felt like I was a huge reason why we lost. As I I didn't have my I didn't have 100 percent. I barely felt like I was at 50 percent, and uh, I really that that really was disheartening. Uh, I I will tell you that. So for the next couple of months, as I'm trying to heal my finger. I also want to practice every day because I'm like, I can't let that disappointment happen again. And um, one thing led to another and I overworked myself. And honestly, if I could go back, I could, t I would tell myself not to bowl the beginning of 2019. Uh, I would have let my finger heal uh, because my healing process ended up lasting four or five months longer than it needed to because I went back to bowling early. And uh, believe me, now I am the first per first person to tell anybody that when they have an injury to not compete. Um, but you live and you learn. And 2019 was disappointing. And I, honestly, um, it, it's really hard to dig yourself out of that hole more mentally than physically. Because once I felt good physically, um, it was more just mentally getting back to the place where you're at, you're at peace with yourself. And you can tell yourself like, hey, bro, you're fine. Uh, you just can bowl now. Uh, because for five or six months there, every time I threw a shot, I was worried if my finger was going to hurt. 
Uh, it's really hard to compete at a high level that way when you're scared to hit the ball. It's just mm -hmm. not going to work out. So uh, I, I wish I could tell my younger self, like, hey, bro, I, I know you want to try to repeat at all the success, uh, but health is more important. I didn't know that at the time. Uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, I think it's a stepping stone for me. You know, everything that happens, uh, everything happens for a reason. And at, uh, throughout 2019, I was getting better. I was growing uh, as a person. I was growing as a bowler. And uh, I did make a stepladder in August of 2019. And I really felt like I was back. I mean, I, I crushed the event. Uh, I almost saw a stepladder more because of nerves than anything. But um, I was really happy to make a stepladder again. And one month later, we're in Sweden. And a freak accident happens. And next thing you know, I have a... Uh, torn meniscus and a sprain in my left knee, which you definitely don't want uh, at my age. So it is hard, you know, um, it led into now what's 2020 and another, I would say tough year for me. I didn't make the double show with Chris Brather. I bowled much better this year. I'm, I'm way better mentally than I've been in years. Uh, but physically, we're just playing catch up a little bit. So you kind of you skipped over from, from 2018 to 2020 pretty quickly there. Uh, I, don't like, a, I don't like 2019 too much. There's a, a pretty <laughs> special day in 2019 that we're, that we're hoping to talk a little bit about. Uh, that's yep. when you came to visit us in Las Vegas. Um, and again, you know, an injury-filled year and there's some disappointments and mental struggles coming off of the, the world championships in Hong Kong. Uh, but you did something that many, many, many thousands of millions of bowlers potentially dream of, and that's uh, – you know, you reached the pinnacle at the Open Championships. It wasn't the eagle that that uh, is so sought after, but um, with your brother there, with your teammates, uh, again, you guys had a, a fun group. You were there. You had a great time, but you worked hard together. Um, and while things didn't go quite as well as you wanted uh, in the team event, or really at all, um, for one game, for one day, everything fell into place for you. Uh, and now you share a spot in the record books at the Open Championships with your brother. Next time you bowl, uh, hopefully this year in Reno, uh, you guys will be announced uh, by Lane. Just just let him know it's by Lane number uh, for <laughs> for the for the honor scores and the champions. So don't get nervous, uh, and we'll double check the announcements now. We'll make sure, but uh, you guys now will be announced uh, as both having shot 300 at the Open Championships. And uh, first, we'll yeah. talk about that game, that moment, uh, and him running up and hugging you uh, as you came off the approach. Uh, and then we'll we'll talk about what happened after. Yeah, so um, obviously 2019 uh, wasn't going that great. Um, but one thing that, uh, I mean, anybody who knows me and my family knows about is uh, Matt's probably my biggest supporter. I mean, he's watching my scores every single event, every day, and uh, nobody has my back more uh, up, for, up or down, you know. And uh, he was really excited for Nationals. And I had finally taken some time off before Nationals that year to let my finger heal. That was one of my first events where I felt like my finger uh, was 100%. And uh, I had not bowled much prior, to be honest with you. Uh, weeks leading up to it, I knew I couldn't prepare the way I would like to. Um, I, I was bowling with some of my best friends, Craig Neiderfer, uh, Justin Nyman, um, Dan Pollock, and uh, my brother. And, uh, you know, that year, uh, well, last year, we were looking at it more of let's get into this together. Let's grow something that we can do for years to come now. And uh, we want to build something that we get to look forward to every year. And that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, so my expectations for 2019, honestly, were not very high. I was excited that I just got to bowl again. I got to be there with my brother. I got to be there with people who I consider family. And uh, we did have a rough team event. Um, and the competitive side of me came out when we got down with team event. And everybody on my team was, like, super happy and go lucky. And I'm like, guys. I don't know if you guys know this, but we might finish in the like bottom hundred. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I wasn't too thrilled. So uh, going into doubles and singles, we were all motivated. We we wanted uh, we wanted to make some noise, and we started uh, here and there making some noise. Uh, my partner was striking. Craig Nightifer was striking. Um, we were trying to make some noise. And uh, after doubles, towards the end of doubles, I had no ball reaction. I, I wasn't bowling great. I had like 230, but I didn't. it didn't feel like I had much ball reaction. So I made a ball change, uh, starting singles. And, I mean, like you said, everything everything kind of came together. And um, 
again, I, I believe everything happens for a reason. Um, that whole game, I don't think I threw a shot that was 10 back. I mean, like, when you look at good ball motion, right, you want your ball to, like, go through the pins. Well, my ball was not. But it was striking. So it was hard to change. It was hard to do anything different. And uh, I threw some really good shots in that game. But uh, of those 12 shots that struck that game, I would probably say, like, three of them looked good, four of them looked good. And so in the 10th frame, I was nervous, man. I was, I mean, I had, uh, I wanted it. And, but I could tell that everybody else wanted it, you know? So we didn't have much going on. I mean, we, we didn't have much to cheer for. We uh, didn't have many runs going. And, and then here we are. And I got the front nine. Nobody else really has much score. So then five, six pairs over, everybody's watching. And uh, my last shot, uh, my 11th one, I threw really, really good. And I was, like, super thankful because I honestly think the 11th one is harder than any of them. You get the first one, the 10th, you're like, oh, okay. And then uh, you kind of get uh, lazy sometimes. At least that's that's what's happened to me in the past. And so the 11th one I threw really good. So the 12th one, I was like, oh, this is fine. Uh, be no problem. And then I looked back, and my brother is freaking out. I mean, my brother is going <laughs> – he's like, he won't look at me because he knows that I know that he's more nervous than I am. And uh, my brother and I's bowling relationship especially is so so special because uh, I, he lives vicariously through me a lot. Um, you know, we, we haven't always had the same opportunities, and I'm really thankful for the ones I've gotten. But I know that he lives vicariously through me, and sh shooting 300 at USBC is, is a huge, huge moment for him. And uh, so before that shot, I, I had to take a, a little extra time. I'm a very quick bowler, but I was like – I mean, I had so many things going through my head, and that 12 shot um, was not a good shot. I threw it, and I just prayed. I literally did. I, I got down on one knee. I was like, please, please just give me one more. <laughs> and it happened, and then, you know, the first person running up there is my brother. And, uh, you know, that was the highlight of 2019 for me. Um, I feel like uh, I've had a lot of big moments, um, uh, big shots I've had to throw in my career so far, uh, and I don't think many are bigger than – that 12th one uh, to now create a memory with my brother that we're going to share for a really long time. Now, some brothers would be upset that that's, that that was his claim to fame. And, and now <laughs> you're right there with him, but it, it doesn't sound like that's the case for the Andersons. And now can you kind of look ahead uh, for when we see you in Reno in 2020, uh, hopefully, um, and, and those announcements come around and, and, and obviously you'll be announced as the, the master's champion. Uh, but for both of you to, to finally hear that over the over the the PA at that point, and I'm sure there'll be a look and a hug and a high five. But uh, is that something that you've thought about since shooting 300? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the coolest thing that I always thought of prior to uh, the event was uh, seeing the eagle on the screen or seeing that gold little thing on the screen that means so much, you know, and. Uh, I think that, again, if we go back to 2018, when uh, I saw Kurtz and I, I was like, man, that's really cool, dude. Like, I mean, you stand out here. That's what I, that's what I always wanted. And um, 2019, uh, although I wasn't practicing as much, felt really easy to me because I had kind of accomplished my goal. The USBC Masters um, is kind of the two-for-one event. You know, uh, you get the eagle. So um, when I saw that, I was like, man, like, that's really cool. Like, I got one. And um, I didn't know uh, how special that day was going to be, obviously, uh, up until uh, – or the next day was going to be because Team of I was the day prior. But uh, I would honestly say I thought about it immediately because I kind of like you, Matt. I was like, I really hope my brother doesn't hate me for this because I know <laughs> – I know that he was really happy that uh, he was the 300 of the family. And um, uh, can I go back to 2018 for one second? I got a great story for you guys. Uh, so Matthew won a tournament in Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan, called the Memorial Day Classic. And uh, it's a very big event in Michigan and for all amateur tournaments. And it's a match play event where, like, top 64 make the cut, uh, two games, total pins, and you're out. One game elimination. And my brother, um, in 2014, 2015, it's bad that I don't remember this. Hopefully he doesn't uh, 
get mad at me. I don't remember what year, but 2014, maybe he won the event. And uh, ironically enough, it, it is his biggest win and uh, his biggest moment for sure in his bowling career. Ironically enough, he bowled in the finals, Kurt Pilon. <laughs> and uh, in 2018, I made the finals of the event and I bowl AJ Rice and I end up losing by 10. And, you know, Matt was like, man, great bowling, you know, and Matt was being more talkative than normal, you know, and he, I was like, Matt, I mean, you know, I am sad I lost, but I would hate to, I would hate to put my name on the trophy as well, you know, because they have this plaque in the bowling center with all the names of people who won. And it was really cool to see my brother's name on it. And uh, honestly, for me, I was like, I'm going to get my name on it too. And, uh, you know, so that's the one that Matthew still has. So when I finished second that year, uh, and after I won, or after I won, after I shot the 300, I was like, hey, man, you know, because I didn't take the other one from you, I, I got to take this one from you. So now we both have 300s at the Open Championships. So, um, But but only one of you followed that 300 up with a 137 game. Do we uh, and and honestly, talk about that and, at all? Or and, that... Honestly, and honestly, that 137 could have been way worse. I don't know if you guys remember, but that 137, that is with a double towards the end of the game. Yes, it was. <laughs> That that game, and that's what I was talking. Like that's what I was talking about. I started the next game. I moved one left, and there you go. I mean, everything happens for a reason. I I will tell anybody that that 300 was given to me by the gift of God or something because I did not have the ball reaction for 300, and uh, I moved one left, and next thing you know, I'm in split city. I start the game like big four, two eight ten, big four, two eight ten, and I'm like. Um, because after the second frame, I was like, "All right, Andrew, like, let's get this together. We can, we can still get the singles. You know, we can, we can make a run here." And then I split again. I'm like, "Okay." And then like frame seven, I'm looking at like 190 max. I'm like, "Andrew, um, you really gonna do this? Like, is this what's happening?" And then I split again. I'm like, "It's happening. I mean, it, it's happening right here." And uh, you know, 137 and. Honestly, um, I was kind of mad. About, I, I was mad about it. I mean, I was like, I was making a run. I was, I had 300. I was like, what could happen here? Like, what could go wrong? And then that went wrong. And honestly, I think it's hilarious now looking back on it. I mean, a week later, I look back and I'm like, Andrew, like, whatever, dude. <laughs> like, do you follow up one of your biggest games in Open Championships with 137? At least you have a memory from it. Well, and, and the, the way that I look at it is that, I believe the bowling gods even everything out. It's oh, all yeah. even in the end. So where if they had been uh, more even with you between those two games, you could have went like two-team, two-team right. and still got to plus 37 after two as it was, or plus 33 after two as it was, you went 200, 130, <laughs> or 300, 137. I, well, that, that that is, is, go ahead. That, that is the OC roller coaster. Sometimes that's how it goes. But uh, yeah. I promise that when it's time to announce that 300, we won't talk about what happened afterwards. It would always just be the 300. And in 50 years, when you're still a youngster out there bowling at the Open Championships, uh, nobody's going to remember that except maybe for, for us. And, um, you know, you'll, oh, you'll, yeah. you'll never I'll, hear the end of it for sure. But. I know I know that you'll remind me. Uh, no, it's – it's uh, I – I look back at 2019 and that Open Championships, and I, uh, I don't remember much outside of the 300. I mean, I remember our good times. I mean, we that was um, outside of celebrating uh, Kurt and them taking the lead. 2019 was so much fun bowling with that group of people, and I really hope we get the chance to bowl this year in 2020. Well, and it's only been six years since your career started at the Open Championships, and uh, it feels like we just lived and talked a lifetime. Uh, just about two years alone, 2018 and 2019. You're right. We hope to see you in Reno in 2020. Uh, once you're back out there, the PBA tour is back. Uh, you're healed up. You're ready to go. Uh, but before we wrap things up today, uh, we know everybody's kind of uh, a little bit of cabin fever. Um, and you already mentioned some of the things you're looking forward to doing when you get out. But uh, is there anything you really particularly miss uh, about the, the outside world that, that you're looking forward to besides throwing a couple games and, uh, and getting sharp for what's coming up? Social gathering. I mean, uh, you know, when you, when we bowl on tour, um, there's a lot of sacrifice. Not, I don't have nearly as much sacrifice as other people. I don't have a family yet. I don't have kids. Uh, so for those who um, miss out on those types of things, uh, right now they they're getting time to spend with their family and doing things of that nature. Uh, for me, 
Uh, my family is a little scattered. We live all over the place. My brother lives in Las Vegas. I have another brother a couple hours north of me. Um, and uh, I'm really, when I get home from tour, from these events where I'm gone from all my friends for so long, the first thing I look forward to is, hey, guys, let's hit the golf course. Let's go, uh, let's go out and have a drink of the adult kind. And um, let's see each other. You know, we, we catch up. Um, and this time it felt like, uh, yeah, I mean, this is crazy because I get home and I was rushed home kind of. Like I got on a flight thinking just in case, just in case things get on lockdown. And then, you know, worse comes to worse and we're on lockdown. I get to text my friends. We're FaceTiming, but it's just not the same, man. I mean, nothing's like the interaction. And when when I was gone for four months, uh, that's what I missed, you know. And so now we're at home and I'm I'm home. But it doesn't really feel like home at the moment because I, I don't get to spend time with the people I want to spend time with yet. Well, we're certainly glad that we had the opportunity to spend some time with you today. Daniel, any final questions before we, uh, we say goodbye? I know we can talk to these guys all day about some of these great memories. There's way more we can talk to Andrew about, probably some things that aren't appropriate for, uh, for both TV. <laughs> but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, any final questions? Uh, I do have one short story to tell about that 300 last year. Uh, I was the video guy back there shooting it, you know, for the for the Facebook video and the uh, the, the highlights and whatnot. And there was a uh, a group from Louisville, where, where I'm from, where I'm at right now, that was there bowling that week or that that stretch. And one of the the guys, he and his wife brought their son, who six was 16 years old, and he was watching you bowl. And we were talking about your ball reaction, and I and you know you mentioned how three or four of those strikes were maybe flush, and the rest were swisher, maybe a trip four, you know, not quite in the pocket. And I told the kid, and this was a great learning moment for him, I said, if Andrew doesn't judge his strikes and he just throws the ball, he's probably going to shoot something here. And the kid was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, if he starts judging his strikes and he goes light or rolls a two pin and tries to make a move off that, he might leave a four pin or he might wrap a 10. He's got a wide pocket. They might not look great, but if he doesn't judge his strikes, he's going to shoot something here. And maybe three weeks ago, the kid shot his first 300. And he said, I remembered what you told me about Andrew Anderson. And I had four strikes that weren't really good, but I was telling myself to not judge my strikes. And he shot his first 300 doing it. So you, oh, that's were, awesome. you were able to, to help me teach this kid something. And it's something he's going to remember for the rest of his life. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know, I, um, in some of those moments, like when we start judging our ball reaction and judging our physical game and doing these things, uh, we lose a lot of score just because of the mental thoughts going through. And in that, in that moment, I mean, in a lot of the moments when I'm bowling, I, I just get excited when I strike. You know, like, however they fall, I'm just excited. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, I don't have to shoot a spare. This is cool. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, yeah, it's it all came together in one game. Um, if anybody asked me my ball reaction for that game, I say I have like 184, which I proved rightfully so the next two games that my ball reaction was 184. And uh, somebody, somebody up above was looking down and uh, said that you, that you deserved some breaks here and they gave them all to me in one game. And uh, I'm really thankful for it. All right. All right, Andrew Anderson, the inspiration, Team USA member, Masters champion, 300 shooter at the Open Championships. Uh, for Daniel Farish, my name is Matt Canizar. I want to thank you for tuning in to today's Inside the OC. Folks, that's the news for now. That is the news for now. We'll see you on the lane.